study a subject with you this morning that seems to be a hot topic right now with all that's going on in the world. And that topic is Armageddon. The very mention of the word sends shivers up and down the spines of millions of people. This very scary apocalyptic word refers to what the Apostle John called the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Notice, what kind of battle is it? It is the battle of God Almighty. That means that God himself will be in charge of the battle and its outcome. This is the final war that will be fought just before the Lord appears in the clouds of heaven. In fact, it's an expression of the war that began in heaven when Satan and his angels were cast out. The question is, where is this battle going to be fought? Is it a literal battle? Who are the ones that are going to be fighting in it? And what are they going to be fighting about? If you listen to the news at all, you know that it's difficult listening without hearing something about the unrest in the Middle East and the fact that Iran is soon to have a nuclear bomb, as well as various dictators being assassinated and new governments being formed with what looks like radical Islamic leaders taking over. And so millions of people from a variety of religious backgrounds are wondering if Armageddon is soon to be fought on a certain piece of real estate near Jerusalem. But before we go any further, maybe we ought to read about this great battle as it's described in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, beginning with verse 12. Revelation 16 and verse 12. Before we read, let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we humbly bow in your presence, thanking you for your word, thanking you for the Holy Spirit that gives us enlightenment. And we pray that you would be here with us today to be our teacher, to be our guide, and help us learn those things that you would have us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 16, beginning with verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. First of all, let's determine if what we just read is literal or symbolic. During the sixth plague, or any of the seven plagues for that matter, will there be a literal angel pouring out a literal vial full of God's wrath upon a literal river? No. That's not going to happen that way. Are the three unclean spirits like frogs literal frogs? Again, the answer is no. Do they come out of the mouth of a literal dragon, a literal beast, and a singular literal false prophet? Again, the answer is no. Are the spirits of devils working miracles literal or symbolic? Well, I would say literal but spiritual in nature because we're dealing with spiritual beings here, are we not? What about the kings of the earth and the whole world being gathered to the great battle? Would that be literal or symbolic? Well, I would say literal in the sense that this gathering will involve everyone in the world, as the Bible says, but symbolic in the sense that the whole world cannot possibly be gathered into one literal place because of room constraints, if nothing else. 
Now, verse 15 is simply a warning from Jesus. But is the garment he referred to that we're supposed to keep a literal garment or a symbolic garment? Well, it's symbolic because it represents the robe of Christ's righteousness. And if we lose it, will we literally walk around naked? No. And what about the word Armageddon itself? Is that literal or symbolic? Well, Revelation 16.16 16 is the only place in the entire Bible where this word is used. And the concordance says it's a symbolic name. And besides, no one has ever been able to prove that the place called Armageddon is a literal place. There's been a lot of conjecture and speculation, but nothing conclusive. And so we see here that there are mostly symbolic terms and only a few literal terms. And even the few have a spiritual application. And so based upon all this information, we have to conclude that Armageddon will be a spiritual battle between the forces of good and evil, between Christ and Satan, the battle that had its origin in heaven, but the final outcome determined right here on this planet just before Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. To deceive men and lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. The last conflict between truth and error, and not nation and nation, the last conflict between truth and error is the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Don't ever forget it. Armageddon has to do with the Ten Commandments. Don't let anybody present a theory to you that takes the focus off the commandments of God and the third angel's message that exposes Satan's devices to overthrow that law. The Bible makes it quite clear that for God's people, our battle is spiritual. And there's no reason to think that it's going to change to a physical one just before the Lord comes. That would be totally out of character for God to change the principles of the great controversy at this stage of the game. Let's look at a couple scriptures that would show this to be true. Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so it's very clear from these verses that our battle is a spiritual one. It's not fought with carnal weapons, but fought with the Word of God. Also go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Once again, the Apostle Paul is very clear about where our battle is. Now, there are uh, a few other important points we need to think about also here. When we were reading Revelation 16, 12 to 16, did you notice the words Israel or Jew when we were reading those verses? No. 
Did you notice anything in these verses that would indicate that the sixth plague has anything to do with radical Islam or some kind of jihad? Again, the answer is no. This alone is a rather interesting point since it's a common belief today that Armageddon is thought to be a military battle with radical Islam annihilating Israel and then the whole world taking out Islam. Also in Revelation 12 and 13, the dragon and the beast that are also mentioned in Revelation 16, 13 are depicted as having seven heads and ten horns, which of course are highly symbolic. And all these symbolic terms have to be interpreted correctly if we're going to come up with the right answer. Now, in order to have a battle, you have to have two opposing sides, don't you? And it's pretty clear that the side that has the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the spirits of devils, and Babylon, that's mentioned down in verse 19 of Revelation 16, have to be the bad guys. Because all these various entities are the ones that will be destroyed in the end. Then on the other side, we have God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who comes as a thief, and all those individuals who watch and keep their garments, which, of course, would be the good guys who survive the Battle of Armageddon. Good, only in the sense that the righteous are who they are because of Jesus living within. Now let's take a look at verses 17 through 21 in Revelation 16. Back to Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. As we already read in verses 12 to 16, we saw that the gathering to the battle takes place under the sixth plague, but the battle itself is fought under the seventh. Revelation 16, beginning with verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, without going into great detail here, what is the effect of Armageddon? First of all, there is a great earthquake, the likes of which this planet has never experienced. Next, the cities of the nations fall. Then islands and mountain chains sink out of sight. And lastly, 60-pound hailstones fall from the sky. And so Armageddon cannot be a local battle in a small valley in the Middle East, but a global conflict that devastates the whole earth. Now let's go back and read verse 12 again. There's another important point we want to notice here. Revelation 16 and verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Are we to conclude that the drying up of the great river Euphrates that flows through modern-day Iraq is going to evaporate or drain into a giant sinkhole? Or is this aspect of the prophecy symbolic like the rest? Well, since the river Euphrates is mentioned just before the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which are clearly symbolic terms, it follows that the river Euphrates is also symbolic. Not only that, but verse 19 speaks of great Babylon, 
which according to Revelation 17, 3 and 4, is symbolically represented as a harlot woman riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Also according to Revelation 17, 15, this harlot sits upon many waters, which John says represents large people groups. And so, as you can see, this is highly symbolic all the way through. During Old Testament times, it was Babylon that sat on the river Euphrates. In fact, it flowed right through the city. And you'll recall that it was King Cyrus who diverted those waters in order to gain entrance and overthrow that kingdom. And so rather than having literal Babylon and the literal river Euphrates being literally dried up and overthrown like it was anciently, we have mystery Babylon or spiritual Babylon and the large numbers of people who support its various false religious systems withdrawing their support because the judgments of God are falling on her. And why do they withdraw their support? Because the sixth angel pours out God's wrath upon these waters, or upon these people. And so according to verse 12, it's God's wrath that dries up the waters. It's God's wrath that causes people to understand that God holds them accountable for supporting Babylon with their money and their presence at her various worship centers. And they all begin to abandon her because of this plague. We already read that water represents people in Bible prophecy. And we also know that water causes things to grow and flourish. And what happens when water dries up? That which once flourished because of its life-giving properties withers and dies. And so just as the waters of the great river Euphrates caused Babylon to flourish and to become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world with its beautiful hanging gardens, and just as the river was diverted or dried up by Cyrus and the glory of Babylon came to its end, just so, in a spiritual sense, the same thing happens to mystic Babylon when its supporters dry up. And the Bible makes it clear that it's the wrath of God that accomplishes this. This means that just before Armageddon, God's judgments will be poured out upon those who have supported Babylon's deceptions and false doctrines instead of putting on the robe of Christ's righteousness and keeping it on, even in the face of a very severe persecution. And this brings us to another point we should consider and understand. Even though Armageddon is a spiritual battle, spiritual battles oftentimes have physical consequences, don't they? Just think of all the wars that have been fought over differences in religious ideology through the years. However, when Armageddon is fought, the battle is during the time when the last plagues are falling. That means that probation has already closed, and the people of God will not suffer death at that time. The faithful will be going through the time of Jacob's trouble during this time, and even though they will not suffer physical death, they will go through a terrible time of mental anguish. But will there be physical bloodshed during the time Armageddon is being fought? Absolutely. But it won't be the blood of God's people, because the tide will turn from them as the objects of hatred and universal scorn to the wicked killing each other, just like happened a few times in various stories in the Old Testament. When the voice of God turns the captivity of his people, this is when the seventh vial is poured out because verse 17 mentions the voice of God coming from his temple in heaven. And everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. This is a fulfillment, by the way, of Jeremiah 25, 32 to 38. But I'll let you read that for yourself. At the coming of Christ, the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, consumed with the spirit of his mouth, and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. 
And so during the time of the Battle of Armageddon, during the seventh plague, will there be physical bloodshed? Yes. But it won't be the blood of the saints. And it won't be radical Islam annihilating the nation of Israel as many believe today. It's much larger than that. And it involves all the wicked who are alive at that time. The righteous will see it all transpire around them, but they will not be participants in the battle at this point. Because just like he did for King Jehoshaphat and the children of Judah in Second Chronicles 20, God will fight for his people and deliver them. Notice what it says about this in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. And continuing on through the rest of the chapter. Revelation 19:11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and do what? Make war. Here's Armageddon. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and shall tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So here it brings it into the context of the plagues, the wrath of Almighty God. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And so once again here we see that the kings of the earth have their armies and they're fighting against that army of heavenly beings that comes from heaven, not nation against nation. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. This isn't the lake of fire that burns with brimstone uh, at the end of the millennium, but there's a fire that devours the wicked when Jesus comes, and then again after the holy city descends from heaven. Verse 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That's the final outcome of Armageddon. Now, getting back to Revelation 16:12, This verse tells us that not only will the wrath of God dry up the river, but that this drying up of the water is what prepares the way for the kings of the east. And notice, it doesn't say that these kings arrive on the scene at this time, but simply that the way is prepared. The way will be prepared for the kings of the east to come when the withdrawal of human support from mystical Babylon dries up during the sixth plague. 
But again, it's not until the seventh plague that the battle is actually fought. So, let me just briefly summarize what we've learned so far. In Old Testament times, Cyrus, whom Isaiah 44:28 called my shepherd, attacked Babylon from the east. You can read all about that in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 11. Then, as it says in Isaiah 44, in verse 27, Cyrus's planned attack would be to conquer Babylon by drying up the great river Euphrates, freeing Israel from the oppression of their enemies. You can read all about that in the first chapter of Ezra. We won't take time to do it now. But do you see the type and the antitype here? Doesn't the Bible refer to Jesus as God's shepherd? Absolutely. And doesn't it say that Christ will come from the east to rescue his people from the clutches of an enemy that would destroy them for not going along with their program? Friends, Armageddon is not a Middle East showdown against the Jews, as seems to be the popular teaching today but a global conflict between the forces of good and evil, between Christ and Satan. Are there things happening in the Middle East that seems to fit the picture here? Absolutely. Are Islamic terrorists and jihadists totally irrational in their fanatical ideology? Absolutely. Could their goal to destroy Israel and Western civilization as the big and little Satan contribute to the final events leading up to Armageddon? I would say that is a good possibility. But Armageddon is much bigger than a military conflict in a small valley near Jerusalem. Armageddon is global and spiritual in nature. The bad guys will far outnumber the good guys at this time. And the reason God's deliverance will be worldwide is because the people of God are scattered all over the world and not all physically gathered into one place. Ultimately, Satan and all those he has managed to deceive will be defeated when King Jesus descends from the eastern skies with his heavenly army. And because this is certain to happen, I believe the most important thing we can consider at this time is brought out in Revelation 16:15, where Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Here is the great burden to be carried by each one. Are my sins forgiven? Has Christ, the burden bearer, taken away my guilt? Have I a clean heart, purified by the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Are our feet on the rock of ages? Are we hiding ourselves in the only refuge? The storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? Are we one with Christ as he is one with the Father? Are we heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? Are we working in co-partnership with the Savior, making sure we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ is more important than understanding the whys and wherefores of Armageddon. Because if you know Jesus as it is your privilege to know him, you will be on the right side of this question when the battle takes place. If you will put on the garment of Christ's righteousness today and keep it on, you will be delivered by the voice of God as he thunders out of his temple in heaven and from his throne saying, It is done. Loving Father in heaven, as we consider the things that we have studied this morning. We pray that you would help us to know the most important thing, to know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. As we see all the things that are taking place in this world, there is no question in our mind that we are living in the last remnants of time. 
Not only is the world going crazy in the Middle East, but our own country is in serious trouble financially, morally, and in every other way. Lord, help us if we should be so fortunate to be alive to see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven without seeing death, that we will have developed a character like Jesus. We know that the great conflict that began in heaven will have its climax soon on this earth in the battle of Armageddon. And we pray that that day will find us faithful and on the right side of this and every other question. Thank you for your word. Thank you for a knowledge of the prophecies in these last days. But thank you mostly for your sacrifice on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. May it not be in vain for anyone within the hearing of my voice. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.